Hi, my name is Jim Meyer. I'm a math teacher with Seattle Public Schools. And I want to start by saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this is happening. I'm sorry that you don't get to come to school. I'm sorry that you don't get to see your friends as often as you like. And I'm sorry that we, your teachers, don't get to hear you learning. We don't get to hear your ideas about math or problem solving. When you discuss them with your friends, when you come up with new solutions, that's a really exciting time for us as teachers. And we miss that. So we tried to think of a way that we could sort of remedy that in the meantime. And we're trying this out. We're going to make some videos. Here's a math video for grades four or five. We're also going to release videos for grades K1 and two, three. But don't just watch the one that goes with your grade level. We're hoping that you'll watch all of them. We're hoping that you'll watch the K1 videos with your younger siblings. We're hoping you'll watch the four or five videos with your older friends. We're hoping that your family will watch with you as you take all of this in. Because math is for everybody, and math is much more fun when it's done as a group. When other people get to hear you articulate or express your ideas, when you get to hear other people's ideas, when other people change your mind and you come up with new ideas, that's where the excitement about math comes in. So please, call everybody over. I also want to tell you that you'll be receiving a package, and in this package you'll find lots of things for language arts and science, but there'll also be a math packet. And in that math packet will be some ideas about how to think about math in your daily life, how to mathematize the world around you, some rules for a game that you can play, and also some worksheets from your student workbook. These aren't homework. They're not due when you get back. They're not going to be graded. They're there to keep you engaged, to engage your curiosity, to keep you from getting bored, to keep your skills sharp for when you do come back to school. So take your time with them, enjoy them, help your younger friends with their math work, ask your older friends for help with your math work, and remember, we're all in this together. Okay, so in this video, we'll talk about the game that you'll find in your packet, but we're gonna do some other things also. Uh, let's start with an activity that you may have played or done in your classroom. This activity is called Which One Doesn't Belong? What's gonna happen is that I'll show on the screen four images in a set. And one of the images in the set doesn't belong. And your task is to think about which one you think doesn't belong and why. Why is it different from the other three? Another way of thinking about it is, what do three of the images have in common that the fourth one doesn't, that makes that fourth one not belong? Now, for this game or this activity to be the most fun, you need to spend some time thinking about it. So I'm going to flash the image on the screen for about 60 seconds. I guess that's not flashing. I'll leave the image on the screen for about 60 seconds and let's all just think about it quietly and develop our ideas. And then I'll leave the image on the screen a little bit longer so you and the people you're watching with can share your ideas about which one you think doesn't belong and why. I'm also going to, going to include a phone number that you can text your response to. If you'd like to tell us which one you think doesn't belong and why, you can text it to this number. Please check with whoever pays the bill for your cell phone if it's okay if you text. Okay, let's take a look and see which one doesn't belong.
So today we're going to talk about equivalence, and that's often um, referred to in terms of fractions. And when I talk about fractions, I find it really useful to use sort of a tape diagram or a bar model. And I'm going to use two of these because I'm going to think about this one as being one whole unit. So there's one. And here I'm going to count off my fraction. So I'm going to divide or partition this one into thirds. I'm going to color in one third. And that's what we are calling our fraction. We'll call that point right there one third. Now, I'm going to ask a question that might sound silly at first, but it's going to sort of be the foundation of what we're going to talk about today. And that is, how many one-thirds would I need to make one, to equal one? And if the question does seem silly to you, I want you to think about why. Did you know the answer right away? Is it obvious to you? Like, what is it about it that makes it a simple question? So if you answered three-thirds will make one, that makes sense. They look equivalent. I've colored in each of the thirds. There were three of them. They are at the same point on our number line as one or it's equal to our tape diagram that we've assigned the value of one unit to. So there it is. Let's see, though, if we can express that mathematically. Like, How could we write this math problem to show that these three things equal one? Think about that for a quick second. What math problem would show that these three th things equal one? Maybe we wrote this. Maybe you thought about this. That seems to be a pretty good abstract or mathematical representation or an equation that represents what our diagram is shown here. Is there a simpler way that we can show this? Right? Is, do you know another amount that is equal to one-third plus one-third plus one-third? Or if we erase the one here, what's another thing that we could put there? Right? You might think back. And remember that, ah, oh, well, that's three-thirds. One-third and one-third and one-third is three-thirds in the same way that one apple plus one apple plus one apple equals three apples. But here's the thing. You may not realize this, but what we just did is one of the most confusing things, I think, in elementary school math. And that is equality. Oops. We just kind of breezed by it, but we just said that these two things are equal. One-third plus one-third plus one-third equals three-thirds, and one-third plus one-third plus one-third equals one. So I want you to think about what that means for these two numbers. What does that mean for those two numbers? Let's think about this. Could I write 3 thirds equals 1? Is that true? Can, that, can this be true? Because that's crazy. I mean, if I told you that two numbers, two different numbers are equal, like, for example, 4 equals 2, you might think I'm crazy. But does this seem reasonable to you? And if it does, you're getting a sense of how fractions can be equal to other numbers. Now, you've, if you're in fourth and fifth grade, you probably have experience with this <laughs> equivalent fraction, and you might have found it frustrating in the past. But I'd like you to think about how easy it was to accept this. 
so a moment ago we were thinking about how two numbers could be equivalent and how they could not be equivalent. For example, four seems to be greater than two. It's farther to the right on the number line. It's twice as many as two. They're just, they don't seem to be equal to each other. But with three thirds and one, there seems to be some intuition about the fact that if I color in three parts of one, I've made a number equal to one. So we have this idea of a number that's equivalent to another number. And that comes from the idea that the fraction is smaller. It's, it's a part of one. So if we count enough of those parts, we'll get there. It's sort of in the nature of how a fraction is expressed. But my next question is this. Are there other numbers that are equal to one? Let's just think about that for a minute. Are there other numbers that also equal 1? You may have come up with some. I'm going to pick one that's just easier for me to draw. I'm going to partition 1 into two parts. And we don't call these parts tooths, although I think that would be hilarious if we called them tooths. We call them halves. My theory is we call them halves because we don't want to be saying tooths all the time. Um, we don't want to be laughing in math class. Is that true? No. So I'm going to call <laughs> I'll stick with calling them halves. But it looks like if I color in two halves, I will equal one. I will come to the same point on the number line, or I will come to the same distance in these tape diagrams. So let's record that and say that. If I had two tooths or two halves, that would be equivalent to one whole. Seems like there's another fraction that's equal to one. You've probably thought of several others as well. If you want to make a representation, whether it's a tape diagram or some other model, that would be great. And if you wanted to include an abstract representation or an algorithm to go with it, and show that this equals 1. Now, I'm putting them all on a line here right, with two different equal signs in the same equation because I am saying that these two things are equal. Right? I could say that 2 halves equals 1. That's, that's my conjecture. And I'm wondering if you have some of your own. And feel free to share them. If that phone number that I've provided is working, you should be able to text an image of your models here. Okay, I'm curious about those other things. Here's our next question. And this is going to seem even weirder than saying that two numbers can be equal to each other. If I say that three thirds equals one, and I say that two halves equals one, they equal the same thing. What can I say about these two fractions? Is there another number that two halves is equal to? Not just one? That seems even crazier. Earlier I was saying that you could have some number that is the same as one. But it turns out that that number isn't the only number that it's equal to. Three-thirds might be equal to something else other than one. And this kind of gets to this heart of why fractions can be confusing. Two halves can look very different depending on how I write it. Two halves could look like one. And I think by now you've probably realized that two halves can look like three-thirds. These are the same quantities. Right? If I color in three-thirds, I've made an amount that's equivalent to two halves. That's equivalent also to one. Now, there is a condition under which that's not true, and it's really important to point it out. I'm going to leave that hanging for now, but I want you to think about it. 
Is this always true? I mean, it certainly looks true here, but is it always true? Will two halves always equal three thirds? And will they always equal one? There's a little bit of a question there that we'll get back to next week. I'm really curious about this because it seems right, if I'm explaining it the way it seems right in my head, but I can also see a place where it might break down and not work. And we'll talk about that next time. Hi, everybody. So this game uh, that's included in your packet is called Box and Numbers, but in order to play, you need to know the rules to a simpler game called Dots and Boxes. To play Dots and Boxes, you need, well, some dots. And these dots get laid out in a grid, and the grid can look like this, right? Annika, you've played this game before, right? Mm -hmm. Could the grid also look like this? Could it be a square? Mm -hmm. Could it go this way as well? Mm -hmm. Could it be as big as you want? Mm -hmm. Could it be as small as you want? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe could it be too small? Maybe. Maybe maybe too small. That can be something for you all to mess around with. Seeing what's the, what's the smallest game you can play. And so once you have your dots, players take turns and they connect the dots. So I might start by connecting those two dots. And I might try and connect these two dots. Now the goal of this game is to make boxes and it might look like I'm not trying to make a box, but I'm actively trying to make boxes, but I don't want to let my opponent make a box. Oh, Annika, let me make a box. Okay, and I'll put my initial in there because that's how we'll keep score at the end. So one variation is you can just keep taking turns, right? We could take turns. Another variation could be if someone closes a box, they get to take another turn. So let's switch rules. See, Annika gets to take another turn at this point. And now another turn because she closed the box. And now I have to be careful to try and avoid giving her another turn. Uh, so I might go here. She might go there. And eventually at some point, someone's going to give up a box. So when you play the rules of when you earn a point, you get to go again, the game gets a lot more intense and involves a lot more strategy. A simpler version would be to simply just take turns making lines. Let's switch back to the old version for a second, Annika. Here's the version where we're just taking turns. Can you close that box? So Annika closed the box and now I get to take a turn and I get to close a box. So there's two different variations on dots and boxes. Play with both, see which one works better for you. All right, have fun, Annika. Looks like you're winning. I'm gonna cut you off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> bye. I wanna to end today by reading from this book. There it is, The Little Book of Mathematical Principles. There's an interesting chapter on zero, which is a really interesting number. Um, okay, here we go. Zero, founded by Brahmagupta, who lived from 598 to 665 AD. This chapter is called The Recognition That Zero Is a Proper Number. Nowadays, zero is an ordinary part of how we write numbers and calculate with them, but it took a long time for it to actually be accepted as a proper number. For most of recorded history, the number system started with one. There was no number zero. When the system for dating years was developed in 525 AD, the system goes straight from 1 BC to 1 AD. There is no year zero. There's no need for a zero when using Roman numerals. The number 10 is represented by X, and we do not have to show that there's nothing in the ones place. By contrast, in a place value system, some indication is required. Something needs to be in the ones place to show 10. Before modern times, arithmetic was, done, arithmetic was done using a counting board with columns for units, columns for tens, columns for hundreds, and so on. A symbol for zero isn't required. We would just simply leave the column for tens blank if we wanted to show something like 105. When writing numbers, though, it's useful to have a special symbol to show that a number is missing. 
Such a symbol was used in Central America by indigenous peoples centuries ago. The Babylonians used two small wedges in their decimal system to indicate zero. Using a symbol for a missing digit in a place value system is really useful, but it is not the same as recognizing zero as a number in its own right. This idea was developed by an Indian mathematician, and in 1628, Brahmagupta wrote out a set of rules for zero that included the sum of zero and a positive number will be positive. The sum of zero and any number will be that number. And this is an interesting one. Zero divided by zero is zero. Now we can agree with the first two, most likely, but division by zero is actually forbidden nowadays. Think about this. If a car travel, travels zero miles in zero hours, how fast is it going? See if you can come up with some other division problems that involve a zero and see what you find, whether dividing by zero or dividing zero by something else. Again, you can text your ideas to the number on the screen. All right, we'll see you in a couple days. Thanks for sticking with us. So if you have received the package of resources from Seattle Public Schools, in the math packet, in the very last page, you'll find this puzzle. Sort of, you could think of it as a challenge problem or an extension problem, but I like to think of it as just a puzzle. It says this figure is made up of a rectangle and two triangles. Find the area of this figure. Now, I want to assure you that you know everything you need to know about area to find the area of this figure. Although this figure might look very different than any figure that you've been asked to find the area of in school. Earlier, I talked about something called Math Practice 8, looking for repetition and using that to extend or make generalizations. Well, now I wanna talk about Math Practice 7. It's that, that refers to thinking structurally. So what that means is, even though this looks different than what you know about area, if you think about the structure of area models or arrays, you might notice that they will not fit well over this figure. But if we look at this figure and how it's structured or built or put together, you might notice that an area model or an array will work for parts of it. You might also notice that an area model or an array fit other parts of it, sort of, not perfectly, but in a way that makes sense, in a way that you can use. And that's what it means to use structure to reason your way through one of these kinds of problems. So I just want to encourage you to take this on, believe that you know everything you need to know to solve it, and think about how arrays are built, and think about how they fit onto this as a whole, or onto individual pieces and parts of it. Don't think about this as a math problem that you're gonna sit down and solve with a bunch of numbers right away. There's not one multiplication problem that's gonna solve this area model for you. I want you to think about it structurally or in pieces. And we'll come back and take a look at how this might be solved in the next video.